praise you this morning for who you are. We thank you for your faithfulness. It's never ending, Lord God. We can always count on you no matter what happens. We praise you this morning for who you are, and we just ask that you'd open our hearts and our minds as uh, you bring a message to us through Pastor Phil. Bless this day and to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Hebrews, towards the end of the New Testament. We're going to talk about faith this morning. We're in the midst uh, this summer of a series of sermons that you have requested. Uh, this particular one, Galen, is the one you requested on Hebrews chapter 11, whether you remember it or not. Um, 
This is, a, this is a passage that I could preach probably 10 sermons on. I'm going to try to cover it, not really cover it, but touch on it uh, today. And uh, it's about faith. And it's about what some commentators, people have called the hall of faith. Some of the people in the Old Testament who exhibited faith. And I got to tell you uh, that one of the major themes that will come out in the sermon today, I'll keep coming back to it again and again, is that faith is tested. And when it is tested and we respond to it with looking up to God, we grow. Faith is tested. And as it is tested, we grow in the Lord. Well. We're tested by different things, aren't we? Can you name some of the things that, that, that test you? Stress would be one. Politics. Politics. <laughs> different kinds of trials and challenges and all that kind of thing. Well, I want to tell you this last week has been a week of testing for me. Uh, in my extended family, there are some circumstances that are a great pressure on me. And just several things have kind of come together to make this a very, very uh, testing kind of week. So I walked into the elders meeting this morning. I was sharing uh, just a little bit about that with them. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, Dave Jorgensen, who was sitting next to me, looked over to me and he said to, he said to me, is there something wrong with your foot? Because I was kind of bending my foot over, you know, just kind of going like this. And, and I said, well, no, I'm just, I'm just kind of moving my foot around. And he says, well, you have two different shoes on. <laughs> one, one has no heel, it's a clog, and the other has. I said, well, they're both brown. <laughs> <laughs> and at least they're not two, at least they're not two left feet. And he said, I think maybe we're going to have to have, what was it you said, Dave? We're going to have to have a search committee. <laughs> You're losing it, Phil. <laughs> and uh, that's the kinds of things that we go through when we experience stress and when we respond to stress in the right way and when we look up to God. God helps us. So I want to talk to you about faith this morning, faith in God. Turn with me to Hebrews. Like I said, I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I do want to talk about certain sections of it. I want to start out by saying this. Faith is one of those words that's tossed around a lot these days, along with the word believe. Go into garden stores, home decorating stores, and you can see faith, or you can see believe. And my question as I look at the word believe is always believe in, in what? Faith and believe are the same word in the New Testament, by the way. One is a verb and the other is a noun. And I think it's important that you and I talk about what it is that we believe in. Who do we believe? What is our faith in? The object of your faith is so important. So I want to give you just three Three points that kind of cover this chapter this morning. The first is that faith looks up. Open up your Bibles, will you? The first illustration that the author of Hebrews gives to us of faith is in verse 2. He says this, or verse 3, excuse me. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Faith rests in God. You and I as Christians believe that God created the universe out of nothing. God created it. It did not evolve. It was created by God. It was at his command that the stars and the moon and the earth and people and plants and vegetation, all kinds of those things came into being. Faith starts by looking up to God. He is the source of our faith. He is the central figure in this chapter. He's mentioned 15 times. Faith is not a leap in the dark. Faith is not wishful thinking. Faith is confidence in God. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went 
Look at the words, even though. Even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he is going. Faith often takes us to places where we don't really know what it's going to be like. Some of you are aware of the fact that, um, that Andrew and Lindsay are going to be leaving us next month. Um, Andrew's father has, uh, has Alzheimer's. It has progressed rapidly over the past year. He's in stage five of a seven-stage disease. Andrew feels a strong obligation to be there during the last days or months or years of his father. And so they're picking up their roots. It has been a gut breaker for them. But they, they just feel that this is what God wants them to do. He doesn't know exactly what all he's going to do. He has some ideas of a job. They feel like it's necessary for them to move a little bit early so the kids can get registered in school up there where his parents live and all of their extended family live. Um, Faith, faith always overcomes obstacles. Faith always uh, has an element of the unknown in it. But Abraham was called by God to go to a place even though he did not exactly know where it was. Look at verse 11. I'm reading this out of the NASV because the older New International Version, I don't think does justice to it. This verse is really about Sarah, not about Abraham. And in the NASV, and I think in the King James and in the newer version of the NIV, it says, by faith, even Sarah, who was past age, 99 years old, mind you, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had promised. She considered him faithful who had promised. There is no faith There is no biblical faith until we look at the one who is faithful, and that is God. That is God. I was reminded by Mary Ellen this morning at the breakfast table, and as we kissed before I left the house, I was reminded that God is faithful. I was reminded by the elders this morning that God is faithful. God is faithful. He is our rock. He is the one who we look to. He is the one who we look up to. Look at verses 18 and 19. 18 and 19. Again, this is about Abraham. In the beginning, actually start with verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice the one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I just, that verse just absolutely blows me away. Um, God, God goes through this long ordeal with Abraham, calling him out of Ur of the Chaldees, which is down by the Tigris and Euphrates River, calling him all the way to the promised land. He doesn't know exactly where he's going. Somewhere along the journey, he he tells him that he's going to give him a son, and even at the beginning tells him that his descendants are going to be as the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. And then he, he gets where he's going, and God asks him to take his one and only son from Sarah and to sacrifice him on an altar. And Abraham is willing to do that. Even though God has said that it is through this promised son that he will, he will see this, this vast number of people come. And then it says in verse 19, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. You know the story. As he was getting ready to sacrifice his son, a ram that's caught in the thicket appears and that is provided as a substitute sacrifice and what Abraham does thousands of years before Christ becomes a prophetic picture of what Jesus did. Only Jesus did sacrifice his one and only son. Praise God. Thank God that he did. There are almost always obstacles 
and tests in the path of faith. I look at the life of Abraham and I see Abraham running an obstacle course. There are almost always obstacles in the path of faith. Faith looks up. Faith considers the obstacles, but faith looks up. And trust God because he's trustworthy, because he's faithful, because he's always been faithful to us. Secondly, faith looks ahead. If you want to take time to look at it in the concordance this afternoon, you can find out that the word promise or derivatives of it is used 18 times in the book of Hebrews. Look at verse 1, verse 1 of chapter 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I think the King James has faith as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is sure. Faith is sure of what we hope for. Again, this is not wishful thinking. This is not, oh, I hope I get to heaven. This is, this is substantive faith. This is substantive hope. This is, this is confidence which rests on the sure foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've, I've been witnessing, as you know, to a, to a gentleman, uh, an older gentleman, took him out for coffee. Actually, he's been paying for coffee now uh, this last week. And, and uh, I've just been praying for little opportunities. He, he doesn't, I've asked him if he's sure he's going to heaven or where he's going when he's going to die. And he says, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. This last week we were at coffee and we went for an extended ride. Um, people who are in those kinds of situations need to get out, and especially if they've had background where they've been outside, they just need to kind of see the outside. And as we were driving back to, uh, to have coffee, um, we had coffee second, took the drive first. I, I got to thinking... You know, he has, this guy's a woodworker, and he's told me about a, a padlock that he's made in his earlier days that's made out of wood. And I thought, padlock made out of wood just fascinated me. He's not been in my house. I plan to, we plan to have him in our house sometime this summer. He's, he's worked on ships in the Great Lakes, cargo ships, and so I thought, one of these days I'm going to have him over and we're going to have dinner together and then we're going to watch Captain Phillips. Great, great movie with Tom Hanks about cargo ships and at any rate. And, and so I, I said, hey, after we get done with our ride and coffee and all that, could I, could I come back to your apartment? Could you show me that padlock? And then I, then I said, as we were still driving back to his place, I said, you know, I, and it's true, I said I was having some quiet time this morning where I was talking with the Lord and reading the Bible, and the thought came to me, faith is the key that unlocks the door of heaven. And then I just shared a couple of verses with him. It's not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but it's according to his God's mercy that he saved us. And so I shared that with him. And I looked at the key and the lock and worked it and looked at all the doodads he had around his apartment, and we just left it at that. And we're, we'll talk about it more, but he's not ready for the, whole, for the whole bale of hay yet. So we're just doing it a little bit, of, little bit at a time. F faith is the substance of things that we hope for, not, oh, I sure hope I'm going to heaven. No, hope in the sense of being assured that you're going there. Certain of what we do not see. On the screen, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Will you read it together with me? So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Faith looks up. Faith looks ahead. Look at verse 7, verse 7 of chapter 11. By faith Noah, when warned about 
things not yet seen in holy fear built an ark to save his family in what was not yet seen look at uh, look at verses 9 and 10 verses 9 and 10 by faith again abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac, his son, and Jacob, Isaac's son, who were heirs with him of the same, there's that word promise, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Looking forward looking forward what, what's the what's the song um, with eternity's values in view faith faith lives this life with eternity's values in view faith lives the 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 or 94 or 95 already that God has given to Russ, faith looks forward to the life that is to come that in terms of length is infinitely long than the life that we live right here now. It affects our giving. It affects our lifestyle. It affects the way, we, the way we live every day. Look at verses 13 through 16. Verses 13 through 16. All these people, the ones he's mentioned before this, Noah and Enoch, which we'll get back to in a minute, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They didn't see the Messiah. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things shows that they are looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. I, I'm looking. I'm, I'm looking forward to retirement. I don't know when it's going to happen. I, I'm still going to be involved in ministry of some kind. It's tempting. It's tempting to look at retirement, thinking, "Oh, I want to. I want to build my dream home. Or I want to." I want to live, um, I, I think sometimes we look at retirement as a time to, to just ignore all responsibility and live a life of ease. Um, I've, I've heard people who are older, nobody from here has said anything like this, but I've heard people who are older look at retirement and look at the church and say things like, well, I'm getting old, I'm gonna let the young bucks do it. As if to say you get to a place where you just kinda of give up, or sit back in the easy chair and watch TV or whatever. Um, I don't know what kind of form of ministry I'll be in someday. I, I do know that God has called me to, to be a witness for him until I'm as old as I ever get. I look at these passages and I, I, I read about people in the Old Testament who lived by faith till the day they died. A lot, a lot of things going around in my head today, these days. And, and whether you're 20 or whether you're 72, whether you're just starting high school or whether you're 65 and ready to retire. I think God asks us all to, 
to look ahead and to realize that the life we live by faith is a life that we live till our eyes close for the last time. And then we don't have to live by faith anymore because we're there. Amen? If you look at verse 22, it says, looking that before Joseph died, he looked ahead and gave instructions for his bones to be buried in the promised land. They, they aren't even in the promised land yet. They, Moses hasn't led them into the promised land yet. They haven't even gone through the 400 years, the people of Israel, of, of persecution in Egypt and testing and all that kind of stuff. And Joseph looks ahead. He says, I don't want my bones buried in Egypt. I want my bones buried in the promised land. He was looking ahead. Moses, look at verses 25 through 27. Verses 25 through 27. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a fill in the blank, will you? Short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was, what does it say? Come on, what does it say? Looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Moses took the long look. Moses was uh, probably the most prominent heir of the throne to the Pharaoh in Egypt of anybody that there was. But he gave that all away so that he could identify with God's mistreated people, the Jews. He deemed persecution for the sake of the Messiah better than a short-lived life of pleasure, of sin. He looked ahead. He considered his reward in following God more valuable than Egypt's treasures. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Lastly, faith pleases God. Faith pleases God. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 of chapter 11. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And it goes on in the next verse to say, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Enoch pleased God. Just thought of this. Just thought of this. On your tombstone. Could, could your relatives in truth write David, Brad, <coughs> Betty, Cindy, pleased God. Phil, what a thing to be said about you. I didn't say kept all the rules. It's not talking about being a legalist. It's not talking about, it's just, did, did they please God? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 says, the righteous one will live by faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, which we just read, says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We must come to him. We must believe that he exists. And he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith pleases God whether or not we experience success in human terms. I want to read to you what I think is one of the best passages in the entire Bible. I've read it over and over again, and it's in this same chapter. 
and it starts down towards the end at verse 32. Will you take your Bibles? Will you look at it? Will you read it? Will you read it again this afternoon when you go home? Let me just read these verses, and then I have an illustration that I want to show you. Verse 32. And what more can I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, Daniel, quenched the fiery the fury of the flames, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women who received back their dead, raised to life again. The Shunammite woman who gave lodging to Elijah and her son was raised from the dead. Others, look at this, others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destituted, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the deserts and the mountains and in the caves and the holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, the Messiah. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Let me repeat it. Faith does not guarantee a positive outcome, a successful outcome in human terms. Faith pleases God whether it is successful or not. Faith pleases God whether it ends up in your being blessed till you just can't take anymore or till you die for your faith. Faith pleases God. I ran across this this past week, and I just love this idea, this concept. Faith is a muscle. Faith is a spiritual muscle. Life is a mixture of sunshine and shadows. Amen? Life is a mixture of triumph and tragedy. Amen? On anybody. Saved or unsaved, we all have our difficulties. We all face our stresses. We all face really hard times and really good times. Faith pleases God in the midst of all that. Faith is a lifestyle. Faith pleases God because we live by faith, whether we're in the sunshine or in the shadows. We look up, we look ahead. And it pleases God. Faith is a muscle. It grows when it's tested and exercised. It atrophies when it's not used. Galen, since you requested this sermon, you get to be my guinea pig this morning. Come here. Faith sometimes comes in very small trials. But those small trials sometimes last a long time. Faith can exist in trials that are chronic. I'm not going to ask you to lift that one. That's a piece of cake. (laughs) Sometimes faith comes in big doses. How many of you would like to see Galen try to lift this with one? We're just going to make you do two curls. You can do with one arm and then the other arm. Okay. How many do you want? One. One and one arm. Get around. Now pick it up and turn turn and face the crowd. (laughs) Not not gonna happen? No. All right. No faith. No faith. (laughs) No, no muscle. James. Come here, James. Where are you? You can go sit down. You can go ahead and sit down. This guy wrestles cattle. I don't know. I'm hearing 120 pounds from the peanut gallery back there. (laughs) What is it, Ryan? About 115. 
115. One hand. Not going to happen with one hand. There you go. Just, just one of them. Anybody else want to take a shot at it? Andrew, you're next. Jerry's looking at me like, give me a shot at that. Do you think you could do it? No? Seriously? His, dad, his kid's going, go, Dad, go! <laughs> Come on, Jerry. Come on. No. Oh, he's going to try it. Huh? Not with one hand? No. Just one? Curl? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody want to build us a new communion table? <laughs> when that thing hit, I was waiting for it to go. Right all through it. Faith, that, that's, that's what testing is like. Right? Have you ever had many trials that just seem to never end? Have you ever had whoppers that are short-lived? Have you ever had whoppers that are long-lived? Faith is spiritual muscle. Faith is spiritual muscle. If you use it, if you face the weight and the trial, your muscles grow. If you don't use it, if you drop out, if you say, oh, the heck with it, your muscles atrophy. Now, here's the clincher. Here's the part that I just love. Look at chapter 12. I'm not going to take as much time on 12 as I did in 11. We'll be done here in just a couple minutes. Look what he says. Therefore, after he lists all these people of faith and those who experience tragedy and those who experience success, look what he says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, now let me stop. I know this is a very simple, very simple hermeneutical tool for most of you. Hermeneutics meaning the study of Scripture. When you see the word therefore, you always ask what it is there for. Because it always points back to what's before the context, and it always concludes with some other thing that we are supposed to grasp of hold of, or some conclusion that we are come to, or some action that we are supposed to take. So, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, who, who are the witnesses? Hmm? Everybody in chapter 11. You don't have to go to seminary to figure that out. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, everybody in chapter 11. And Paul, like he does so much, because he was, I think, a sports fan. He, he uses boxing. He uses races. Um, you know, track kind of stuff. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, well, the witnesses are those who've gone before us. The witnesses are those who were in the stands, already in heaven, and to some degree know what's going on down here, and they are cheering us on. I believe that with all my heart. My dad's cheering me on. My mom's cheering me on. The people who've gone before me, like the Sunday school teachers I've had, they're cheering me on, and they're cheering you on. They're saying, go for it. Therefore, let us, and this is really cool in verses 1, 2, and 3. Let us, let us, let us. This is the let us section of the scripture. 
Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangled us. Let us throw off those things that trap us so often in our Christian life, our besetting sin. Let those things that are kind of braided into our life, because that's what the word entangled means. It speaks of the braiding, like you braid a girl's hair, or like Jesse Ventura braids his hair. Give me a break. Little, you know, big guy running around. He's got this little donkey tail, whatever it is. That's, that's not inspired. And, but, but braided, the things that are braided into our lives that, that entangle us, the things that we let get in and we say, well, that's not going to hurt me too much. Lay aside everything. When a, when a track runner, I've gone to a bunch of different track meets. Um, and and I, they, they take off their, their outer garment. They take off their jacket. They take off their outer sweats. And they, they trim down as much as they possibly can. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Is there something entangling you? And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Remember, faith is a muscle. It grows by being tested and exercised. It atrophies when neglected. I love this quote from A.W. Tozer. Look at it. Nearly all the great examples of faith and victorious grace, which we find in the scriptures, came out of situations of extremity and distress. God loves hard places, and faith is usually born of danger and extremity. So let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set out for us, and let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Why? Verses 2 and 3, because he's the author and the perfecter of our faith, because he, he builds our faith. He started it, and he will continue to build it. Because he knows from experience that life can be hard. He's familiar with suffering and grief and disappointment and opposition and misunderstanding. He knows all about that. So, verse 3, look at him. Look at him, because he'll perfect your faith just like he authored it. He knows what you're going through, and he will help you to grow and not lose heart and not be weary. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what you're going through today. It may not be anything like what I'm going through. Maybe something that's totally different. Maybe being misunderstood by others. Maybe family stresses. Maybe... I don't know. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Because he's growing you. He's growing you. He knows what you're facing. He knows what it is to lose a son. He knows what you're facing. And he will get you through this. He will get you through through this. Fix your eyes. Fix your eyes. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Father, I pray for these people that you have given me the uh, privilege and joy for almost 10 years now of uh, of shepherding and thank you for the months and years to come thank you for the way you will continue to bless us as we continue to look to you help us to put aside anything that entangles us for people who are in this room who are entangled by various kinds of things that that hold them up and that 
pull them back from running full bore in faith. Point those things out to them by your spirit and help them through your grace to take off what entangles. Help those who are facing what, th- what seem to be chronic weights, big or small. And help us all to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who is acquainted with all of our infirmities and our struggles and our trials and our misunderstandings and opposition, and to fix our eyes on Jesus. Fix our eyes on Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team. Great, great old hymn of the faith. Um, talks about looking, looking to Jesus. Let's all stand together. My faith looks up to thee. Bow your heads, will you? I'd like to take uh, just 30 seconds. And I'd like you to, in the midst of that time, and then as it comes back to mind this afternoon and in the days to come, I'd like for you to, uh, to revisit whatever it is that you're going to talk about with the Lord over the next 30 seconds. But will you take um, whatever entanglement you might be facing, And will you take it to the Lord and ask for his strength to move out of that entanglement and to do whatever's necessary to strip down so that you can run the race unimpeded? And secondly, if some of you, and I know some of you are, facing trials, some of them small, some of them really pretty large, would you just just commit that to the Lord? 
would you ask him to help you respond in faith to whatever that trial is so that you will walk by faith and not by sight? I'm going to give you just a half a minute. Will you visit that with Jesus at your side? Father, help us to visit our entanglements with confession and repentance and return to you in faith. Help us to visit our trials, our calamities, and our really hard difficulties. Help us to visit them with faith and with grace and with a long look of what you want to do in our lives and the lives of those around us. Help our faith to grow. Help us to use it and not lose it. I pray in the strong name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.